we're gonna go over pretty much uh, stuff as it pertains to you guys when it comes to initial vent settings and things that you might be interested in in the ER. Everyone has a copy of the PowerPoint, right? Uh, there's some stuff I'm gonna skip around just because we're kind of short on time, but um, we're gonna split it into two basic parts. The first is gonna be ABGs, which I'm mostly gonna skip. Uh, mechanical ventilation, the stuff that you guys are actually interested in. Initial vent settings, uh, mode types and nomenclature, and more importantly, the confusion between the different types of modes, which I'm sure you guys have seen already. Uh, specialty modes and specialty vents, which some of which you'll see here at St. Joe's and some you'll see later on in your career. And then we'll quickly talk about pulmonary mechanics, uh, plateau pressure, airway resistance, things like that, actual readouts from your vent that will actually um, differ depending on your disease process and what you could actually change to help uh, help the patient from a therapeutic standpoint as opposed to just ventilating them and getting them extubated whenever you can. Um, Waveforms, again, very brief. We're not going to go into a lot of detail for that. And tidal CO2, dead space tidal volume ratio. And then we're going to split up into stations. We kind of have three stations set up. We we're going to put one in the back, but there's not much room. Uh, I have some of my coworkers here. Uh, that's Julie in the back. She's my director. Um, and then uh, John, my supervisor. Lauren, I'm sure you guys have seen them. Um, they'll be kind of helping out with the different stations. And Dr. Chong is actually coming as well. I'm sure some of you guys have done rotations with him already. He's one of our intensivists. And he's going to help out um, with one of the stations here. Uh, you guys don't normally do bronx down in the ER, but you do work with the bronchoscopes quite a bit. Uh, difficult airways, um, angioedema. I mean, just a couple weeks ago, we had Dr. Dulewski intubate. Actually, you've done two in the past month with that, with that bronchoscopy, so with really hard airways. Um, and then uh, and you also do it for foreign airway obstruction, things like that. So it's nice to actually kind of get a grasp of how the scope actually works. So we brought one over with the little mannequin there. I'm um, not going to be too, talking too much about intubation technique. You guys have already, you know, hammered pretty hard on that one. Uh, we're going to have a neonatal station over here, talk about um, intubation differences with neonates, because that's probably something you guys haven't seen much. Um, Kim, one of our NICU therapists, is going to be here later on. and We do we actually do intubation or um, airway exchange tubes with the uh, intubated babies every week. So she's got, like, over 100 intubations under her belt. If you guys have any questions on intubating neonates, she, um, She's going to give you some good advice with that. Um, and we have a little LTV vent over there, the ones you guys see in the ER. And we, she can go over um, initial vent settings for kids. And then over here, we have our actual ICU vent. We wanted to bring one of these over to show you guys waveforms. Um, as you guys can see, with our LTVs, we don't really have the screens. So um, looking at waveforms kind of really helps understand the modes and how they work. Um, and then, yeah, we'll just kind of rotate through, and then that will be that. You guys have any questions? Okay, I, I, I think we should be good. I mean, we can always, when people get up and kind of move this way later on, uh, we can move one of the stations back there. So, acid-base balance, not gonna go over too much here. Um, stuff you guys already know from Gen Chem and from med school, I'm sure. One thing I do wanna mention here, uh, if you ever actually wanted to calculate uh, your pH, uh, obviously bicarbonate is the main buffer system that we use here in our body. and uh, carbonic acid, which is the conjugate, conjugate acid for that reason, the pKa is 6.1 as opposed to the actual textbook pKa because that's our pKa at our um, physiological body temperature. So um, obviously we don't actually measure carbonic acid in the body, but we can get that indirectly by multiplying it by 0 0.03, which is the solubility constant for CO2. So at any point, if you want to know what your pH was, granted you're going to get it most of the time from your um, ABGs and VBGs anyway, uh, you can take your bicarb and then also multiply it by whatever your PaCO2 is on your ABG or VBG, times 0.03, and then you can calculate your pH that way using that equation right there. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I feel it is important, and it causes a lot of confusion. We actually report bicarb two different ways here at St. Joe's, which I'm sure you guys have noticed by now. Um, does anyone know what the C stands for on bicarb? What was that? Corrected is one that we often hear, and that's that's actually good because I think you guys will get something out of this. I think I heard one person say calculated, and that's actually what it is. So it's not actually corrected. Your bicarb with the C on it, that is calculated from, because our you know, ABG machines, they measure your pH, and they measure your CO2, and then it calculates your bicarb that way. The problem with that is CO2 actually travels from your tissues to your lungs three different ways. One is through bicarb. Another way is dissolved, which is your actual PCO2 you're measuring there. And the third way is bound to hemoglobin. So as you can expect, the more elevated your CO2 is, the more off your bicarb is going to be. So if you look here, these are actually, most of the stuff you see here is actually off of our patients here at this hospital. 
your calculated and your standard bicarb here are about two tenths difference just because your CO2 is pretty close to 40. Standard bicarbonate is more or less the corrective that you're referring to. Um, it's basically your bicarb that's corrected to a normal CO2. So it's a good way to measure just your metabolic status right off the bat. Um, but you have to be cognizant of the fact that the more hypercapnic or hypocapnic someone is, the more off of 40 they are, the more off your bicarb is going to be. So then the question is, which one do we actually report here in this hospital? Um, you can do the calculation or we can just tell you. But if you do Henderson Hasselbeck with both of these bicarb values, you'll actually see that we actually use the calculated bicarb and not the, the standard. Now, if you've worked at a hospital or a done rotation somewhere where they actually work with your standardized bicarbonate and not your calculated, um, you can actually look at your base excess or base deficit because that's more or less going to be equal to um, how far off of your normal bicarb your standardized bicarbonate is. So um, that does cause a lot of confusion. When people come here, they, they see our ABG printouts and they see two bicarbs and they want to know which one it is. Um, it's that one. And, and the nice thing is only one is actually reported on Cerner. Uh, the one that's calculated is the one that's on Cerner. So that's the one that you know. But before you see them on Cerner, when you order ABGs, the RT is going to come and they're going to bring you a slip. So you'll actually see it look just like this. Just know that the one, with the, the one that's calculated is the one that you're actually looking at. Any questions with that? So in addition to bicarb reporting on your ABG, you also have bicarb reporting on your chem panel, which I don't want to go into detail too much, but you know, when you guys are looking at your fishbone diagram, your chem seven, you guys know that bicarb is actually reported that way as well uh, from med school. And then you also know that it's actually reported as total CO2, which can cause a lot of confusion. I mean, the total CO2 is actually the correct way to report it. It's, it, it uses a completely different machine in the lab, but it reports, it's mostly bicarb, but it also takes into account your dissolved CO2. So they're more or less synonymous. The problem is when you're looking at things from an acid-base standpoint, they're complete opposites of each other. CO2 is a Lewis acid, and then bicarb is its conjugate base of carbonic acid. So it's really hard when a nurse or a CLS or someone who doesn't fully understand this concept might call you and say, hey, you have a critical value, uh, your CO2, and they'll call it CO2 because this is how it's reported in the lab. Your CO2 is 13. And if you're not aware of the fact that they actually mean the bicarb, I mean, a, low, a CO2, um, a bicarb of 13 is a metabolic acidemia, and a CO2 of 13, a partial pressure CO2, is actually a respiratory alkalinity. So knowing the difference is important. Um, you could, when they tell, when they report that to you, you can either just look on Cerna yourself, and if it's, you know, if it's reported with your lice, then you know it's actually a bicarb CO2. Um, and if, it, or in when, whoever calls you, you can just ask the units. If it's millimoles per liter, then you know it's your bicarb. And if it's millimeters of mercury, then you know it's actually from your gas. So that has caused a ton of confusion with RTs, nurses, and the residents that I've worked with so far, and even attendings. So it's actually something I wanted to go to go over. Does that clear up some confusion that you guys might have seen here so far? Whole CO2 bicarb thing. So a um, little slide that goes over ABGs and VBGs, the differences. So when you're ordering an ABG, of course, it's a little bit of a biased slide because I'm drawing the v ABGs and the lab's drawing the VBGs. but um, Knowing, no, I'm like, yeah, totally order VBGs all day, guys. Um, knowing the, you know, the diagnostic value of an ABG versus a VBG, if you're looking at, you know, mainly I oxygenation, then your ABG is the way to go. It's also going to be faster. Um, but if you're just looking at pH or you're looking at CO2 or you want to look at lactate, um, most of the evidence shows that they correlate pretty closely. Of course, if someone's really, really hypercapnic, then a VBG is not going to do you very good. But, you know, the things to keep in mind, because also you're, dealing with patient satisfaction, and one of the biggest complaints is how many times they get stuck, you know, and they really don't care that they got, you know, we go in there and explain to them, oh, we got stuck twice for your sepsis panel, and then also your, you know, your IV, and then we have to explain to them that it's arterial gas, they really don't care, you know, so if it's something that can be, now VBGs can be actually be added to your chem panel, it's the same tube, so if you're looking at something diagnostic and you want to know just your pH, um, you can actually add that onto your chem panel. Um, that being said, there are situations where an ABG would be helpful. Obviously, you have refractory hypoxemia, ARDS, clinical signs and symptoms of hypoxemia. If you can't get a pleth on someone and they look tusky, then by all means, ABG. Suspected hypercapnia. Um, question on that. So, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, BBG, uh, but a lot of times, the reason we like you guys, Brown, is the speed. Yeah. If we, have, if we can't you guys a blood sample within you know, a few minutes, we can get the results back. Waiting for lab, it's gonna be oh wow yeah no no totally totally agree and that's that's actually this last bullet point that went over and code and near code situations 
Um, if you're like sort of suspecting hypercane, but not really, obviously AG is not the way to go. But if you're starting to get your peak T waves, and maybe your QRS starts to widen, you get a little sadness or a little bit, you want to know the K right away. Um, we can do it with an ABG, or if you know that lab's there, and this is actually, we've been able to do this. If they're drawing, you can actually call the RT and say, hey, you can run a VBG off that blood. And we can actually take that blood that you drew and run to our machine and run a VBG that way and get lights from it. So all without having to subject the patient to an extra stick. So by all means, you know, if you have to order an ABG, do it as quick as you can, we'll get there. But um, you just have no problem if we hand you a VN sample of that. No, no. We just have to make sure it's ordered the right way. But most of the time, if you're in an emergency situation and it's ordered wrong, we're just going to order correctly anyway for you. So, but yeah, no problem with that at all. Actually, up until recently, um, AB, uh, VBG with lights wasn't actually built out in our lab. So whenever we ran it, they would actually come back and you know get really mad at us. We'd have to explain to them, oh, it was a code situation. I'm not going to tell them no. But they actually built it out now. So we can do VBGs with lights with black tape. All right. So uh, to the, the main reason why we're here, mechanical ventilation, initial vent settings. Um, we'll go over it very briefly here. Your settings are mostly split into two main categories, ventilation and oxygenation. We're going to go over each of them separately. Ventilation affected by your alveolar mental ventilation, which is your beaters per minute, uh, tidal volume minus your anatomical dead space, times your respiratory rate. Um, I put in the VD there because it's just something to be mindful of. You might not always see it. You might always, you might, most of the time you'll just see minute ventilation expressed as tidal volume times respiratory rate. Um, but obviously someone like me who's like five foot six and someone like Oren who's six foot like 80, we're gonna have a lot of different tidal volumes and as a result if you have us both intubated on a vent at a volume of 500 and a rate of 12, we might have the same minute ventilation but he's gonna, I'm gonna be involved in a lot more gas exchange than he will because a lot of his air gets just lost in his anatomical bed space which is your space between your mouth and your alveoli. So, um, so minute ventilation inversely proportional to pH CO2, very basic stuff, thus the more you breathe the more your pH goes up. Oxygenation, on the other hand, it's affected by mean airway pressure, and I say mean airway pressure as opposed to PEEP. We mostly know it as PEEP, uh, but also because it's the increased mean airway pressure that actually increases our oxygenation, and there's more than one way to do it. PEEP is the way that we're most familiar with, uh, but there's other ways you can do it, such as increasing your inspiratory time. Anytime you're spending more time with positive pressure in the lungs, you're going to increase your oxygenation. Uh, inspiratory time is obviously not the first choice we use because as you increase your inspiratory time, you're also decreasing your exhalation time. So with patients who are having trouble air trapping, COPD or asthmatics, you're going to end up um, increasing your, your CO2 that way. So we usually go with PEEP first. And then FiO2, obviously, the higher percentage of oxygen you have, um, the better you're going to oxygenate. So we'll go through each of them individually here. Tidal volume, TIVA set directly, uh, and which is the way we're most familiar with. When we're, put, when we're intimating someone, we tell you the tidal volume that they're on, that's first and foremost. And it's based on current pathology in mils per kilo. This could vary depending on who you're talking to and um, you know what text you're reading, but these are general guidelines uh, for the most part. Uh, seven to nine mils per kilo for normal lungs or if you're intubating for airway protection. Five to seven mils per kilo if you're looking more at um, acute lung processes. Um, it's, don't be afraid to go with higher tidal volumes if you actually need to, especially with uh, patients who don't have any acute lung injury. We're so used to keeping people with low tidal volumes because we're just, you know, we hammer that home. You know, you lung protective, lung protective, but the problem is over time if you hypoventilate, you're going to start to get really atelectatic on, you know, the distal part of your airways. And when you're trying to extubate them, it's a lot harder for them to do. So um, if there's nothing, if you're not suspecting any immediate airway disease, you know, tidal volumes is 600-ish, maybe even more is not something that we normally hear of, but it's, you know, as long as your peak pressures and plateau pressures are okay, um, then it's something you can do. And then obviously, yeah, low tidal volumes can cause atelectasis. So kilograms is based on ideal body weight, not actual body weight. Anyone want to tell me why? When, you, when you're dosing your medication, you know, obviously, the bigger you are, the more surface area you have for you, more in, intravascular surface area you have, the more your base meta, metabolic rate is. But when it comes to tidal volumes, we're looking at our ideal body weight, which is based on your height. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, that's the thing. So, so that's a good question. So your tidal volume, it's either set directly, which is you're setting your volume, or 
indirectly, which is your pressure. If you're in a pressure mode, then you're going to increase your pressure and steady your volume, which we'll get to in a in the future slide. But, um, so it's based on idle body weight because this is a picture of our normal stocking patient here. You can tell there's a lot of adipose tissue here, but as you can see, the lungs, they're about the same size they were before. So if someone's up, you know, 100 kilos based on someone who just like them but a lot less body, body fat but the same height, their lungs are going to be the same size. So you don't want to start um, scaling up on your tidal volume just because someone weighs more. If someone's taller, then that's when you want to start thinking about doing that. So your ideal body weight is always what you're looking at when you're trying to consider your tidal volumes for setting. Um, you have a calculation that you guys do not need to commit to memory, but in case you're curious, it's right there. And then you use that ideal body weight calculation with your mils per kilo to find a little combination of your um, of your optimal tidal volume. I made it really small on the slide because it's not. So, I mean, you can go through it, and you can you know I can send you a bigger one if you want, but you'll see pretty soon that it's not really something that we do too much, especially in emergency situations. So I kind of tailored this towards um, towards you guys. So your respiratory rate set in conjunction with your tidal volume. Whatever you want your set minimum ventilation to be, um, you just basically take whatever tidal volume you have, and then you just divide that into your minimum ventilation to get your uh, target respiratory rate. So here, if you want your minimum ventilation to be roughly six liters a minute, and you calculated your tidal volume to be 450, then you set your respiratory rate at 13. Um, normal minimum ventilation, you want to take a stab at it. I know I've gone over it with a few of you guys when you were oriented. Six liters a minute? Yeah, that's about right. Um, so it's, it's five to seven liters a minute is your normal uh, minimum ventilation. And if you look at it, your equation for this is your respiratory rate times your tidal volume, right? And whenever I'm talking to nurses or new higher RTs and trying to explain this concept, um, I always just relate it back to, especially for the nurses, I relate it back to cardiac output. It's something they can relate to. Your cardiac output is just what? It's your stroke volume times your heart rate. And then the normal for that is also about the same. It's five and seven. So it's really easy to remember. And in addition to that, the units are also the same. It's liters per minute for your cardiac output, beats per minute for heart rate, and mLs for stroke volume. So it's a um, really full, full proof way to try to remember what your uh, normal minute ventilation is. So uh, respiratory rate changes without changes in inspiratory time will affect your IE ratio. This kind of goes back to what I was talking about earlier. This is why we don't mess with inspiratory time first before PEEP. Um, if you were to... Say this is our flow waveform, which we don't have waveforms obviously on the uh, on the um, ER events. But if this is your flow waveform and you have a respiratory rate of 12, what you do first thing we do is we calculate our total cycle time. 60 seconds divided by 12 is five, and that's basically the number of seconds for each breath. So two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So if you have a rate of 12, this is kind of how your flow waveform is going to look. You're going to breathe, breathe out at one second, and then right here, five seconds later, you're going to breathe again. So if we increase our respiratory rate from 12 to, say, 20, and we didn't increase or decrease our inspiratory time, 60 divided by 20 is now three seconds. So now you're breathing every three seconds instead of five. So basically, right at this point, let's see if I can find that little pointer and change my color. After this breath here, you're now breathing again at three seconds instead of five, one, two, three. And right here, even though your flow hasn't returned to baseline, you're going to initiate a new breath. So this guy right there, that's air trapping. You might have heard it as auto-peeping. It's basically the patient not being able to exhale all the way. Um, over time, you can get dy dynamic hyperinflation. That's why when you have COPD ears with, that's a really bad lung. Chest x-rays, they start to flatten out that diaphragm is because this is going on just over time. They can't exhale all the way before they take in their next breath. So um, when you're making adjustments to your respiratory rate or when the RT is, let's say they're acidotic and you have your rate at 12 and you want to increase that thing to 30, or, um, that's kind of a lot, 25, make sure that they also take their inspiratory time and they decrease that as well or else you're going to start to have that air trap we talked about. Make sense? PEEP, talk about it very briefly. Um, how does the mean airway pressure improve oxygenation? We've heard things like alveolar recruitment, um, increased surface area, 
for gas exchange, things of that sort. Um, that never really sat with me because to me, like anytime you have an increased surface area for gas exchange, you also should have a decrease in CO2. So I didn't really connect it with oxygenation um, until I just did more digging and saw uh, this little slide on somewhere about Henry's Law. So it says your solubility of a gas. This is interesting to you guys, I know, because I know how much you guys miss Gen Chem and physics and all that. <laughs> Um, taste your constant, and it shows that your solubility of any gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas above the liquid. So as you can see here, a little bit of CO2, a little bit of CO2 dissolved, and as you start to increase your pressure, uh, more of that gas is dissolved as well. So if you kind of consider these as your alveoli, and these as the pulmonary vasculature, it kind of makes sense. The more you increase your, your intrathoracic pressure, the, more you, the better you're going to oxygenate. So it usually starts out at 5, rarely ever starts out above 8. Um, main downsides to high PEEP and high mean airway pressure, lung distension, and this, this is a big one, but this is the one that you guys I'm sure are told all the time. You know, it's going to decrease your venous return, which will decrease your cardiac output and your blood pressure. So be aware of that when you're increasing your PEEP, that you don't uh, drop the blood pressure too much. ZEEP is an idea of zero PEEP. It's rarely ever performed. Some I've seen it done with people with pneumothoraxes, or pneumothoraces. Uh, it's also been done in asthma before. The idea behind it is you have so much intrinsic PEEP or auto PEEP, you have so much air trapping already that it's, they don't need to have more PEEP added to it or else it's going to further exacerbate the air trapping. Uh, but I've also seen asthmatics being treated with high PEEPs. So it's kind of, you know, there's, there's, some, stu there's some research on it if you want to study it, but more often than not, if you set someone on PEEP zero, you'll be asked more questions than you want to answer. So just keep it to PEEP of five and you should be good. So FiO2 initially set 60 to 100% and titrated. Uh, this is usually, your oxygenation is usually evaluated by your PF ratio. This is a, a value that you'll see a lot of RTs bring to you as a kind of, you know, judge of their oxygenation, even before they're intubated. We'll give you PF ratios when they're on a vapor therm, even if they're on a cannula. Uh, so your normal PA of PF ratio, if it's a term that you're not really familiar with, um, for us, that's our normal PaO2, normal room air. So high, well, 381 is about a normal PF ratio. And just off of this proportion, you can tell that the more FiO2 you get, or the lower this gets, your PF ratio is going to decrease. Less than 300 is usually um, indicative of acute lung injury, and then less than 200, ARDS. This, in and of itself, is not really a um, criteria for diagnosis. They are ARDS, I'm sure you guys have seen ARDSNET protocol, um, or the uh, Berlin definition for ARDS. You need multiple things like your bilateral infiltrates on your chest X-ray, um, no evidence of acute left atrial hypertension, but you need to drop a swan for that. You're not going to drop a swan in everyone in the ER. So, um, but it's just something to keep in mind. Basically, the lower your PF ratio gets, the worse your oxygenating. So, oh yeah, this slide, so I just want to go over briefly, not to over oxygenate your patients, basically. A lot of studies show that patients are way over oxygenated in the ICU, which actually makes it harder for them to extubate. Um, and that's why I put this little graph in here. I don't want to go over the um, oxyhemoglobin curve too much, but just to kind of animate it here, this 100% is going to stay flattened at 100%, whether your PaO2 is 100 or whether it's 500 or whether it's 1,000. You have no idea what it is without being serial ABGs. So the idea behind it is if you're sitting at 100, just have the RT or have the nurse lean the FiO2 until it sits 98, 99, and eventually, like occasionally goes to 100. Because if you're at that point, then you know if you're sitting at a sat right below that that you're going to be at a PaO2 of slightly less than 100 and you're not going to be over oxygenating them. So uh, never let them sit at 100. Sounds like a good thing, but it's really not. So. Questions so far? You all good? All right. So we have a situation here. I'll read it through. Full cardiac arrest just arrived and ROSC was just achieved. RNs are starting lines, inserting a life-saving Foley and prepping you for a central line. Lab is calling you with criticals. You're trying to determine the cause of arrest. Your attending is bringing you down your neck and the crazy guy in the hallway is still yelling at you for another turkey sandwich. So when that happens, do you have time to do anything that we went over? You don't. Um, but the following slides are kind of the ones I really want you guys to remember. They're a little tricks for initial vet settings, which is kind of one of the main things that you guys were asking me about. Uh, when I was first asked to do this. So I was originally going to talk about intubation and stuff, but every single one of your attendings is an airway expert, and the mechanical ventilation side is something where we can more help you as RTs. So you have, um, so
some basic guidelines to follow, and you can pretty much spit out vent settings pretty quickly without having to do any sort of calculations in your head, and you'll be pretty spot on most of the time. And keep in mind, even if you're off with your initial vent settings, you guys will always get an ABG within 30 minutes after you intubate, and you can make adjustments that way anyway. So. Well, <laughs> some of us, depending on our experience, but thank you. Yeah. Well, we're lucky. We're definitely lucky at this hospital. We definitely have a wider scope than we do with our keys at other hospitals. So, um, we're a good resource. If you guys have any questions, you know, feel free to ask us. And we can we learn a lot from you guys too as well. So we're glad you guys are here. Um, seven mLs per kilo is usually safe because you know that this is long protective here, and this is normal. If you're not sure what's going on, just go right in the middle. So average mill height is five nine. So that's why right in this range, around five hundred mils. That's why when someone who can't really explain vent settings to you and says, what should I put them on? They say 500 because you're pretty much in ballpark most of the time. And safe for females, average height's 5'4", and this ballpark is right around 400. That's why you'll often put females at a, a lower tidal volume. And then, of course, you can just adjust it. If they look taller than average, you can add 50 mils, subtract 50 mils. It's not something to get bogged down on when you're dealing with code situations because you're going to get a gas anyway. So just to kind of recap that, Average tidal volumes are that. Respiratory rate, if they have a normal end tidal or a normal pre-gas, maybe you're intubating for airway protection, just keep your respiratory rate kind of close to normal, 12 to 14. Um, if it's post-arrest or hypocapnia, you want to keep it a little higher. You don't want to go too high right off the bat just because um, you're, you're worried about air trapping and you're not really sure about all the physiology yet. So, I mean, here at this hospital, I'm sure you guys have seen by now, as soon as you intubate, the RTs put them on settings and they tell you why. But, you know, when you're... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But when you're, I mean, when you're done with your rotations, um, you know, you're going to be, the, if there's an RT who isn't quite sure what they're doing, they're going to come to you guys for advice. So this is where you kind of need to, um, you know, know, know what's going on. Or if you have an attendant who's not really going to take the RT, put them on event as an answer. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's some of those here too. So you'll have to kind of, you know, explain yourself. So um, PEEP, start at five. If they're low O2s and they're hemodynamically stable, then have the PEEP a little higher. And then for me, this is, I mean, these aren't, these are general guidelines. These are not textbook by any means, but you'll find that most people kind of follow this. This is just kind of something that I do. ROSC, I max out the rows. Non-ROSC, start at 60% in type rate. So. Lauren works a lot at ER. Would you do anything different here if you're trying to keep more events? So BiPAP, uh, I want to talk about very, very briefly. Um, inspiratory pressure and expiratory pressure are set. So it's kind of related to pressure control if you're on a ventilator. Um, it's not PEEP compensated. Don't want to talk about that. If you have more questions on that, you can ask an RT. But basically, uh, the, how you set your pressure, the way it functions is not the same as the way it functions on a ventilator. So if we set them on a ventilator on different pressures than they were on a BiPAP, um, then there's a reason why. So uh, those of you guys who, I think there's about eight of you guys who went with me when we were doing orientation. I kind of went over that in detail. Um, but yeah, the, the, your, basically your changes in PEEP on your BiPAP are not going to affect your pressures. Or they, uh, yeah, they're not going to affect your inspiratory pressure, so they will affect your tidal volume. And then uh, on your LTV, it doesn't do that. So um, your respiratory rate on the BiPAP, we usually set a lot lower than we would normally want for a hypercapnic patient. You see there, it's set at 10, I think. Um, so if someone needs to breathe high, if they need a high minute ventilation, then what would be a reason why we would keep the rate low for a BiPAP? It's kind of counterintuitive. That is, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. So if your respiratory rate's set low, you have more time to exhale. Uh, but let's say the patient is, you're having it set at 10, but they're breathing like 30. So they're, they're breathing way over the spontaneous rate. Any other reasons why we want to set the title or set the respiratory rate low? So let's think about this way. When you have a patient on a BiPAP, what are one of the things that would actually tell you, hey, this patient needs to be intubated? Yeah, so hypercarbia is one. Uh, what, let, so let's say your CO2 is not getting any better, right? Then obviously you'd want to uh, you'd want to intubate. Uh, what other reasons? Alter mental status, exactly. That's that's the key. So someone we put on a BiPAP with a CO2 of like 70, we'll have them on a rate of 10. 
no breathing 30 or anyway so it really doesn't matter but if you set that respiratory rate up to 30 to try to support that it might make sense intuitively because you're kind of taking away the work of breathing from the patient but by doing that you're also masking any decrease in respiratory drive so if you haven't set it 30 and you know you know our er we can't be by our patients non-stop you know we come back you know five minutes later and we realize they've been riding that rate for a while you know and they start they can't protect their airway at that point with the bonnet aspirate what have you um whereas if you set the rate at 10 and they're breathing 30 you walk away you walk back and they're now breathing 10 you should probably go back there and still 11 and see how they're doing make sense so that's that's one of the main reasons why we keep the bi the respiratory rate low on the bypass that being said, if there's people you don't want to intubate, people like NSH COP deers, people that you know are going to be really hard to get off that vent, by all means support them, increase that rate if you need to, go off the CO2 and then eventually get the bypass off. It's all really dependent on, on the patient. So. Contraindications, stuff you guys should already know. I put a star next to apnea, no respiratory drive. This was, this, I mean, this list was got, I got this from one of the, one of the websites, but obviously we put patients who have sleep apnea and central, central and obstructive sleep apnea all the time on the BiPAP so um, and they use it at home as well so by this when they mean apnea they mean acute apnea from whatever disease process they have going on so you can have you know a, a baseline apnea and still be on a BiPAP. Um, another contraindication that wasn't really mentioned here but I want to go over is inability to pull off the mask and this is more along the lines of where you want to place your patient. So um, when you're admitting a patient and they look like they're appropriate for respiratory telly, but they're not able to take the mask off themselves, that's kind of an indication to go to the ICU. Because uh, these patients have, you know, the nurses have a lot higher patient ratios on the floor and we've seen a ton of RRTs, you know, patients have vomited into their masks and what have you. So uh, if they, if they're not able to pull the mask off, they can still use a BiPAP. It's not completely contraindicated, but they need to be watched more closely. So when would you decide to intubate with any of these basically comes into play. Or if they're not responding to the therapy, if you do a follow-up gas and the CO2 is not getting better, go ahead and intubate. Questions on non-invasive ventilation by patent? Good. So vent setting nomenclature, this was the other, uh, uh, along with initial vent settings, this is the other thing that I was asked a lot to go over, is vent nomenclature. Um, vents are called, vents all call their modes different things, just like cars would call the features different things just because they want to one up the other manufacturers but more or less they pretty much do the same thing uh, and it's not really important to know the nomenclature uh, as you can see here these are just so this is a chart actually made back in RT school um, but I mean PCV plus this plus means uh, pressure control if you're on a Draeger Avita which we have here but if you're on a PBA 40 which you might see other hospitals that VC plus actually means P PRVC this PRVC has four different nomenclature types depending on what, what mode you're on it's not really important to get bogged down on all of that. The whole point of this is to basically look at what you have setting and understanding how a breath is triggered and understanding how a breath is limited. So that really defines all your modes and everything can be defined based off of that. Um, so triggered basically means who's actually starting the breath. Is it the machine? Is it the patient? Exactly. Or is it a combination of both? And how the breath is limited defines like what kind of breath you're actually getting. If you're setting a volume, or if you're setting a pressure, or if you're setting a combination of both. Now, once you can define those two things, if you go to any EM conference anywhere and you basically say your mode is that, that, it doesn't matter. They can actually follow along with what you're saying, even if they're on a ventilator that uses a completely different terminology. So it kind of just keeps like a baseline. AC is not a mode. If you guys take anything out of today, just know that AC itself is not a mode. AC stands for, does anyone know? Assist control. So AC refers to how a mo how a vent or how a breath is triggered. So I have a little chart here set up, and we already talked about assist control. That was the first um, mode we went over. So when you have a so when you have uh, a mode where the vent is doing all of the breathing, and you're setting that, it's called assist control. It's not really referring to if they're getting a volume or if they're getting a pressure. It's just referring to how the breath is triggered. Now once you have assist control, you can have different ways that the breath can be limited. And together, these two is actually what defines your mode. A lot of times you'll see people call, say a patient's on AC. Um, that's, I mean, if you want to be technical, it's not a mode. They usually mean AC volume control, but not always. So it's important to, or if someone says, oh, I had them on pressure control and I switched them to AC, it doesn't really make sense because they could be on AC 
pressure control. So the vent's triggering all the breaths. A patient is able to trigger a breath, but they'll get a machine breath. That's an important concept that when we get to a later mode. So whatever you have set on the patient, if they were to trigger a breath, they're going to get that base, basically that breath. So if you, if you have them on a volume control of 500 and they take an extra breath, they're not going to get whatever spontaneous breath they want. They're going to get that 500 as soon as it's triggered. That's the same with pressure and that's the same with volume pressure regulated. So volume pressure regulated, we don't have that on our ER events, but it is the main mode that we use in the ICU and you guys all do pulmonary rotations. Um, so understanding uh, the theory behind it is important which I'll kind of go over very briefly here. Here's our volume waveform, here's your pressure waveform. So if you're in volume control, and let's say you set a volume of like 500, you're always going to get that same volume. And then your pressure is what's going to vary. So let's say you get a pressure of like 30 here, and then your compliance decreases, it starts to get fluid overloaded, your pressure will now read higher to achieve that same volume. And then let's say you diuresum, Compliance gets better, it's now going to read lower. In volume control, your pressure actually is the one that varies. Does that make sense? And then as you can expect, if you were to go the other way and go into pressure control and you're actually setting your pressure at, say, PC of 30, then you're always going to get that 30, but then your volume, you might get 500 here, you might get 300 here, you might get 800 on the next one. Um, there's obviously benefits and downsides to both. Pressure control is more of a lung protective strategy. So if you're worried about barrier trauma, volume trauma, uh, you want to go pressure control because you're not going to throw too much air or too much pressure into um, the patient if you set that pressure itself. But as you can imagine, your minute ventilation will actually go down if you're not paying attention and it'll start to go acidotic on you. So pressure, regula pressure regulated volume control is the third one. And this is the one that we mostly use. It's called APV on some vents that we're on if you're on a um, Hamilton, and then it's called CMV with auto flow, if you want one of these carriers here. That's not important, don't need to know that, just need to know pretty much how it works. So uh, with pressure regulated volume control, the volume is the pressure, it kind of takes the best of both modes. It, you basically set your vent or set your volume, but it delivers it at the lowest possible pressure. So it's a lung protective breath, but you can still deliver the volume that you want. So let's say you have your volume set at 500, and this is your guy here and let's say it takes a pressure of about 30 to get there then on the next breath if it delivers that 30 and your compliance increased so you now have a volume of like 550 then it's going to automatically augment that and on the very next breath because it knows you want 500 it's only going to deliver 28 to get down to 500. so it'll automatically adjust your flow to and to your inspiratory flow to give you different inspiratory pressures to actually maintain that volume it's a combination of both modes, and it's uh, the main one that we use. So. But it looks very similar to volume control because you're setting your volume in both of them. So yeah, the full generic mode names for each of these include the trigger and the limit. So you can be in assist control, volume control, you can be assist control, pressure control, or assist control, pressure regulated volume. Assist control by itself is not a mode. So spontaneous is the next type of trigger. Basically, a patient is doing all the breaths by themselves. This is the other one that you'll mainly see in the ER as opposed to volume control. It can be called CPAP, pressure support, spontaneous, spawn. That again, that doesn't matter. Just basically look at what the what you're setting on the vent, and you'll be able to deduce what mode they're on. If you don't see a frequency or you don't see a respiratory rate, then you know they're in spontaneous. So if you're in volume, there's two different types: volume support, which is only on some vents that we don't really have, um, and then pressure support, which is the main one you'll see where you basically just set your pressure and then you set your PEEP and your FiO2. That's the only two things you set. It looks very similar to pressure control, except you don't have a respiratory rate. So that's how you know. So your settings include your form and your amount of support, volume if you're in volume support, pressure if you're in pressure support, your PEEP, uh, your FiO2, and then also your expiratory sensitivity which is this guy here that indirectly sets your inspiratory time by terminating at a certain percentage of your peak inspiratory flow. Don't want to go into too much detail about that, but um, you can ask us later if you want to know more about that. Just know in spontaneous, they're breathing on their own, and you're just basically setting the amount of pressure you're giving them. 
So this is primarily a weaning mode. When would we actually use this in the ER? I know with your patient that we intubated Dr. Bluski with, I think, Dr. Desma, it was actually your first day when we intubated that. Yeah, yeah that patient. So what kind of uh, patients would we use this mode for? What could we use the mode for? Because we're obviously not weaning to extubate most of the time in the ER. Go that. Thinking out loud. Indications for intubation, what are they? Respiratory failure, those are the big ones. So if you're, and that was a patient that we had, that Dr. Lewski intubated with the, with the bronchoscope, or yeah, with the bronch. Um, if someone's breathing okay and they have no lung pathology, let's say they have angioedema going on, and you don't want to fully knock them out, you can do an awake intubation, and you can actually let them breathe on their own, you just want to protect their airway. And that's exactly what we had there. So you can intubate for airway protection, and you can just leave them spontaneous if they're more comfortable on that. Um, also, another big one is you know, just the ventilator asynchrony. Let's say they're just breath stacking, they're not tolerating the vent at all, and you're trying to sedate them more and they're just too high, hemodynamically unstable. You can just give them some pain meds and see if they work on spontaneous. And if it's basically going to breathe how they normally breathe, except you're just supporting it a little bit and you're protecting their airway. So uh, those are two main reason, two main uh, people you'd see have on spontaneous in the ER. But more, more often than not, you have to snow them out and you're setting up the ICU. So. so we talked about cyst control, we talked about spontaneous. Uh, anyone know the third trigger? I guess. We don't use them much, so. What was that? Uh, well, you can, you can set your time trigger with a cyst control or this other mode. But it's basically a mixture of both assist control, which is where you're setting the mode, or setting the respiratory rate, and spontaneous. Does anyone remember what that's called? SIMV. It's kind of a phased out mode. It's, but I mean, you will see it. I'm, I've looked up some like practice USMLE questions and I've seen it on there. Um, depending on where you work, it might be in your protocol. A lot of surgeons still use it. Uh, but it is there, so it's kind of good to just quickly go over it. Uh, rarely will you ever see it used here. so. It stands for synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. And what it is, the idea behind it is, it was basically the first weaning mode that came out before all of the smart intelligent modes came out. Um, but it's basically a form of ventilation where the patient can breathe spontaneously in between the mandatory breaths. So um, say this is assist control here. And we went over briefly at the start, if someone were to spontaneously trigger a breath, let me go ahead and draw this. Here. If you have them on spontaneous, or if you have them on assist control or on SIMV, and the patient's not spontaneously breathing, the mode's going to function exactly the same. But if the patient were to start spontaneously breathing, that's when you'd see a difference in the modes. Um, and I'll go over that right now. So in assist control, if they were to trigger their own breath right about here, they're going to get the, the full machine breath that I talked about on the other slide. So if you have a pressure of 30, they'll get that pressure of 30. If you have a volume of 500, they'll get that volume of 500. Every single time they trigger a breath. And that trigger is just set by flow. So I mean, you could actually take that tubing and you could shake it. And the, the machine is going to think that they want to breathe. It will give them that full breath. So with intermittent mandatory ventilation, at that same exact spot, if they want to trigger, they're no, they're no longer going to, a, going to get a machine breath. They'll just get a little pressure-supported spontaneous breath. But the problem with that is if they were to take a pressure supported spontaneous breath really close to one of their time machine breaths, it's going to breath stack, which as you can imagine is very dyssynchronous or very uncomfortable for the patient. So they come out with synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation. You're basically syncing it up with your breath, just like if you were doing a synchronized cardio version, you'd sync it up with QRS as opposed to an unsynchronized, which is just a shock on, a, on your fib. So right here, if they were to breathe spontaneously, they're like, okay, the machine knows that you don't have a, a mandatory breath coming up. It's going to let you breathe spontaneously. But on the next breath, if they were to take a spontaneous breath here and you're pretty close to the next machine breath, it will actually change and give the whole machine breath instead. So on paper, it looks like it's actually a pretty smart mode. The problem was uh, they did a lot of studies on it and it showed that because a patient doesn't actually cognitively know when they're getting a machine breath or a spontaneous breath, which shown to actually increase your asynchrony and increase your work of breathing. So there's more intelligent modes out there that um, that we use, and one of them is called ASV, which I'll go over shortly. 
So SIMV, same thing, you have to you deal with your volume, your pressure, or your pressure regulated volume. And you also set your respiratory rate and your PEEP. There's also one more setting. You want to take a stab what it is? You're able to breathe spontaneously. So that, you know, that's a respiratory rate here. So that, I mean, that is one of the settings that you set. But unlike assist control, in SIMV you can breathe spontaneously. So you can actually set your pressure support for those spontaneous breaths. Let's see if it actually saved the uh, drawing. So right here, on that spontaneous breath, this is what you're setting the pressure support for. Whereas in assist control, you don't have a pressure support because when you trigger, you're getting your entire breath. So it's pressure support is that one extra setting that you have in SIV. Again, it goes back to the whole theme about instead of learning the names of the modes on each vent, just look at what you're setting. If, um, I mean, if you, if you have a volume, you know you're, you're in some sort of volume limited mode. If you don't have a respiratory rate, you know you're not in spontaneous. So you're either in assist control or SIMV. And if you see a pressure support, you know that it's SIMV because that's where you can spontaneously breathe. So yeah. Uh, pressure support is the extra one you can get, the extra setting you can get with SIMV. So question, you have two intubated patients. One is on assist control, volume control, which is the main one we use here in the ER. And one is on SIMV volume control. So is there a difference in total min of ventilation if both are paralyzed and writing the set rate of 12? No, exactly. It's exactly the same. So what about if both are spontaneously triggering five extra breaths? And this patient has a pressure support of five. Total minimum ventilation going to be the same or different? It's going to be more on this guy. What about if same thing? They're both triggering five extra breaths, except this guy has now has a pressure support of zero instead of five. This is a tricky one. So why? Exactly. You guys, all get that. So, regardless of what your pressure support is set, oh god, it's not too far. Regardless of what your pressure support is set, if you're in spontaneous SIMV, pressure support of zero will just mean tiny little breath. Whereas if you're on AC, you would still get that full breath. So, when you're looking at ventilator asynchrony, that's another thing you want to think about is if you keep getting machine breaths, your breath stacking, um, you might want to switch the mode into something where they can breathe spontaneously. Oh, good. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about some specialty modes. Um, I won't spend too much time on it, but I do want to talk about ASV because you will see ASV in our ICUs here. And we use it quite a bit. Um, it basically stands for adaptive support ventilation. On other modes, like assist, con like assist control, volume control, we, we set our PEEP, we set our FIO2, and then we set our minute ventilation by setting your respiratory rate and your tidal volume, right? And here in this case, you're actually setting your percent minute ventilation based on your uh, patient's ideal body weight. So the settings you'll see for ASV, you'll actually get told an actual weight, kilo, like weight in kilograms, and percent how much of, of your target minute ventilation you want. So if a patient comes up acidotic, instead of increasing your rate or your tidal volume, uh, you'll just increase that percent minute ventilation. And it's a smart mode because it uses it's called the Otis equation, which I mean I don't have it memorized. You guys don't. It's bottom line is it's basically going to put me out of a job in like ten years. But this guy's like. It's got, it, it takes into consideration your inspiratory resistance and your compliance, dead space, tidal volume ratio, uh, dead space, tidal volume, and it basically calculates best breath by breath, the best combination of tidal volume and respiratory rate to achieve the lowest work of breathing. Um, on this uh, graph here, you can see for this patient, the target minute ventilation is 3.2 liters a minute, and on this little line here is basically every little combination of respiratory rate and tidal volume to achieve that 3.2. So if you wanted someone with a high tidal, a high frequency and a low tidal volume, someone with low compliance, like an ARDS patient, then they would target this part of the graph over here. And vice versa, if someone had a lot of compliance and needed like a lot of time to uh, exhale, they would keep the frequency low and they'd keep the tidal volume high. So uh, this mode basically just adjusts your frequency and your respiratory rate every single breath. It's like having an RT at the bedside and changing your settings every single time. Um, it's a smart mode. We use it quite a bit if patients uh, are asynchronous or if they're kind of 
in and out of sedation. So um, in the patients that this would be good for in this facility, open heart patients. Uh, I've worked at hospitals where this is actually the main mode for open heart. It's not part of our protocol, so you won't see it on our open heart patients. Uh, but um, anyone who is like partly sedated, sort of waking up from surgery, where you need someone to breathe spontaneously, but if they're kind of knocking out, this will kind of kick in and breathe for you without alarming on the vent. That's a, that's a mode that um, ASV is really good for, or a patient that ASV is really good for. A dual pap by level, you won't see it at this hospital. Basically, it's an inverse ratio of ventilation, high inspiratory time, low expiratory time, to help with oxygenation. And high frequent os oscillatory ventilation, we don't use on our adults here, but you'll see it used on our NICU. Uh, the idea is you give lots of breaths at very, very fast rates, um, less than your anatomical dead space. So your gas exchange also actually takes place through the idea of laminar flow going through the center of your airway, and then turbulent flow going around the outside for um, CO2 exhalation. You're setting a mean airway pressure, um, and uh, it's actually shown to really improve patients with refractory hypoxemia or hypercarbia, but we mostly use it in our NICU here. Um, we've used it on adults a few times uh, with patients with doctors who are comfortable with it, but normally we don't. We usually just go straight to uh, the, um, the rotopro bed. NAVA is another thing you'll see in the NICU here when you do your um, your rotation in the NICU. Basically, we put a catheter inside the esophagus and we measure electrical impulses, uh, action potential sent from the brain to the, um, through the phrenic nerve to the diaphragm. And it basically can sense when there's a trigger in work of breathing before the patient actually has to trigger the breath. Normally, if you were to tell the machine that you want to breathe, you would actually have to suck in through the tube and the machine would sense that difference. And the idea behind NAVA is it actually can tell when the brain's trying to do that before your diaphragm even contracts. So it's um, shown to improve, uh, improve uh, work of breathing. We use it um, only on our NICU babies, but uh, in other hospitals, they do use this on adults. So you might see it. Vapotherm high flow nasal cannula. That's something you'll see in the ER quite a bit. As you can see, uh, it, a lot of people think it's just for oxygenation, but because of the high flow flushing out your anatomical dead space, the idea behind it is you're actually rebreathing less of that CO2 that gets stuck in the um, airways on your last exhalation. So you can actually improve ventilation without actually applying any positive pressure. And then Heliox is the last specialty modality I want to talk about. We use it in the ER a lot for asthmatic patients. It leads to more, more laminar flow. Why? Which laminar flow meaning, you know, less turbulent. It's what? Helium, so it's a lighter glass, your lighter gas, uh, atomic number two as opposed to I think seven for nitrogen. And the idea behind this is that 80% helium, it replaces the 79% nit um, nitrogen that's usually in the air, uh, in room air. So um, when you have someone on Heliox and you're having to go up on that FiO2 quite a bit, as you're going up on your oxygen, you're also going down on your helium. So generally speaking, if you have to go above or FiO2 of about 40, it's you, you're usually not getting your therapeutic effect in helium. You're doing it more for work of breathing and not so much for oxygenation. But really, really good for asthmatic patients to use this a lot for. And a lot of people don't know we have it. It's kind of tucked away like in room 54. But if you, if you guys have actually seen it by there, that's what it is. So it's a helium vapor therm. Any questions on any of the modes you went over? I went over it really fast. I'm not sure to actually be able to play with some of the stuff we have here. We good? It can, it, yeah, no, we do. Yeah, we do. Because in a lot of it, some of that assistance in medication delivery is the helium. It's a lighter gas, so it's going in faster. But also with this unit, the vapotherm unit, we use what's called a little aerogen, which is, that's terrible. <laughs> Basically goes in right in line with the vapotherm, and it's a ultrasonic mesh nebulizer. So it nebulizes medication in a lot smaller particles than a normal nebulizer. So um, because of the smaller par particles, you get better deposition in your lower airways. So that combined with the fact that it's helium um, is why you get better medication delivery with the heliox. That being said, that aerogen, we have that on our actual vapor therm units themselves without the helium. So sometimes you'll see, yeah, sometimes you'll see uh, nurses just with, with a patient that's on vapor therm, you start them on a neb because you know the nurses want the treatment done there. They'll just take an aerosol mask and they'll just slap it right over the vapor therm, which isn't necessarily bad, but I mean, if you have a patient who's really, really tight and you know you want to make sure they get all the medication, then 
um, haven't got VRT and they can actually run it with a full aerogen, which is a, a better nebulizer for it. Just call the RT. Pretty much anything, you just call the RT. <laughs> 6847, just commit that to memory if you guys haven't already. I'm sure most of you guys have. I, I mean, as you guys know, we don't actually have like our own WOW that we walk around with, with uh, like the nurses do. So a lot of times you'll put in the orders for like blood gases or BiPAP and like they won't get seen for like an hour and a half, two hours. Not that we're ignoring you by any means, but like if we don't have time, if there's no like break between patients to sit down and chart and look at what the orders are, then we have no idea what they are. So the nurses always have the WOWs there, lab always has them there, right there on the carts. But um, if you need something done by an RT right away, just call 6847 and we'll either do it for you or get someone to do it for you, but it won't be. If you see, if an order was ignored, it was not intentional. Any other questions? Cool. A few more slides here, and then we'll uh, start playing with this cool stuff. Um, so, before I go into this last part, let's uh, kind of imagine. This is a point that I really want to hammer home with you guys. So, let's imagine you have two straws. One is like a little thin coffee straw, and one is a boba straw, like one of those, the really thick ones. At the end of the boba straw, you have like a really, really tight balloon, right? At the end of the coffee straw you have a really, really floppy balloon. You close your eyes and you blow into both and it takes the exact amount of same amount of pressure to blow into each one. So with your eyes closed, how would you know which one was which? Other than the fact that one is way thicker than the other. Can you guys think of any way you can, anything you can do breathing into them to be able to tell which one's which? It has to do with that, it has to do with that. But you're, but you don't know. That's the thing. You don't know if it's resistance or, like, from the from the tight coffee straw, because that would be resistance. You haven't blown really hard, or if it's really really big boba straw with the really tight balloon. You're taking the same amount of pressure to blow into each one. So it's it's true. But you the problem is you're not able to measure that, right? Because because the, the flow shows up on the ventilator. But it's just giving you the flow. If you need a bigger pressure to blow through that, that big straw and the tight balloon, it's just going to give you a faster flow. So again, this, you're right. You do need a, better, a bigger speed or a higher speed through the tight straw, but there's no way to measure that. So what was that? So if you had a big boba straw with a little tight balloon that you could barely blow up, and then you had a really, really small coffee straw with a really big floppy balloon that was easy to blow up at the end of it, and you had your blindfold on and you blew in a boat and it took the exact, you put a pressure manometer on there, it took the exact amount of pressure to blow both things up. So how could you actually tell which one is which? Other than the fact that one is really big and one is small. Peak versus what? Versus what? That, she got it. So the idea behind it is if you blow in a boat and it takes the same amount of pressure to blow in a boat, if you hold your breath at the end of it, the really, really tight coffee straw is not going to be hard to hold open because you already get all the work blowing in, right? All that extra pressure is airway resistance. Versus the really big boba straw with the really tight balloon, if you were to hold your breath at the end of that one, it's still going to be really, really hard. You're going to have a lot of back pressure. Does that make sense? So what Dr. Childs mentioned was plat uh, plateau pressure versus peak pressure. You, th It is shown on waveforms. You do not need waveforms to actually... Uh, evaluate it. You can actually look at plateau pressures uh, right here on the vent. So right here, this guy right here on, um, on the left, this is the small coffee straw and the big floppy balloon I was talking about. It's really high pressure to blow in, but once, you, once you're done with all that work, when if you hold your breath, which is an inspiratory hold here, you'll see your plateau pressure is all the way down here and there's a big difference between your peak pressure and your plateau pressure. And that's airway resistance, which is this little straw here. Versus here, this is your big boba straw with your little floppy balloon here. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a big, uh, you know what I mean, the really tight balloon. I just don't want to draw that balloon. It's going to look funny. So so you have a peak pressure here, and then you hold your breath. You're still going to have a high pressure, but it won't be as big a pre pressure drop as with the thin straw. And what you're looking at is you're looking at your compliance. So when you have the really big straw with a really tight balloon, that's more of a decreased compliance. And when you have the really small straw with a really floppy balloon, that's more increased airway resistance. So in other words, with if Lauren was your RT and you were having trouble ventilating a patient and you had wheezes, you couldn't really tell if they were like 
crackly CHF, low compliance type wheezes, or if it was, you know, asthmatic airway resistance, you can just have him do a plateau pressure. And if his peak pressure reads 50, and his plateau pressure reads 48, then you know it's all compliance. You probably need to dilease the guy or, you know, do something else to kind of help with the compliance. But if he does a, a, a inspiratory hold and his peak pressure is 50, and then his plateau pressure is like 10, then you know all that extra work was actually airway resistance. You know, mucus plugging or most likely bronchoconstriction. So you can throw all the doing ebbs you want and that guy should increase and your compliance should go up. Make sense? Uh, it's a really important concept. It's probably, other than initial vent settings, the main thing I wanted to have you guys take take out of today is knowing the difference between increased air resistance and decreased compliance and knowing that you can actually evaluate that on our on our ER vents too. So. Um, air resistance stuff. So there's actually a button, when we when we plug this in, Lauren will show you, there's actually a button on there that says in, inspiratory hold. You know, some of the RTs are really like possessive over the equipment. Inspiratory hold doesn't actually change the settings. You can just walk right up there and just hit that button and then it'll say right on the top where it would say the peak pressure, it'll say P plat. That's your plateau pressure. So if the peak reads 30, plat reads 15, then you know it's an airway resistance problem. Whatever oven if you want. But yeah, he'll show you he'll show you all those maneuvers on the uh, on the vent when you get there. Him and Tino's here, he's gonna help out as well. So compliance, we kind of went over briefly on this last slide. It's basically the change in volume relative to the change in pressure. Don't want to go over that too much. Example of disease that causes high lung compliance. Um, can you guys think of one? Really? Emphysema, COPD. How about low lung compliance? Pulmonary fibrosis, ARDS. Scalers, going to spend just a few seconds on this because um, you don't have waveforms in the ER, but you, know, you will have them in the ICU. Uh, you can tell a lot of things from this, wasted effort, flow starvation, breast stacking, which I kind of mentioned, showed earlier on some of those drawings. The mechanical related problems, secretion buildup, you'll start to see little um, oscillations in your flow. Uh, disconnections and leaks, you can see that volume actually drop the baseline instead of getting all the way down. There's a lot of things you can tell from the waveforms. Um, but uh, when you're doing your IC rotations, I highly recommend actually looking at the waveforms, talking to your pulmonologist who's with you, talking to the RT, uh, because most of the waveforms you'll see look nothing like they do in your textbook and you kind of want to like figure out why because it'll actually help you really understand how the vent works if you're looking at it um, all the vents from the graphical standpoint so you guys what two months with pulmonary the first year you got one month with them and then you got to be later right you saw a child's going through them and so loops you also get on the ventilators you can get a lot more cool information from this optimal peep levels optimal compliance this is a pressure volume uh, loop here. And as you can see here, it's got right about here, this little almost one to one ratio is a signal of good compliance. When you have something more flattened out here, you can see that you have a bigger change in pressure for not, a, not as big a change in volume. So this would be something like lung shearing, um, uh, alveoli being not all the way open. So this point right here, this inflection point, if you were to draw a little tangent line right here, that would be your optimal peak level. Because at that point, it shows that you're getting a good uh, change in volume for every change in pressure. Likewise, if you're going all the way up here, if you draw an inflection point at this curve, this would be your optimal peak inspiratory pressure. You really don't want to go anything above that. You don't want, basically, you don't want your pressure volume waveform to look like this. Because at this point, when you start to beak, you, you basically, basically get what you're getting on this end. You're getting a lower change in volume for a higher change in pressure. So that's basically lung over distension. You're just trying to fill up the lung too much, and you're going to cause some damage. So you just decrease the pressure until you get rid of that little beak there. These are, again, things you can see on loops you can't really see on your scalar waveforms. So, um, you know, really get a get a look at them when you're in the ICU. And then real quick, this should be the last question on the slide. Yeah, so you have two patients uh, with identical restrictive lung diseases. Both are experiencing decreasing lung compliance. So one of these patients is on cyst control, volume control, and one of them is on assist control pressure control. So based off just these pressure volume loops, can you figure out which one's on which mode? And again, for a lot of I mean, for a lot of you guys, it's the first time you see waveforms, so don't feel bad if you can't figure it out. But it kind of helps put everything together. Pressure on the left, and volume's on the right. Exactly. So you have your increasing volume for this, or increasing pressure for the same amount of volume on the right here. So this is going to be a volume control. And here, you'll almost always see your pressure volume loop showing an almost vertical pressure because it shows you that you're limiting your pressure here and you're not really going above it. 
And the other nice thing about this is it graphically showing what ha what's happening when your compliance changes based on what mode you're in. Here, you're on pressure control. And as your compliance changes, your volume is decreasing. And then here, you're on volume control. And as your compliance changes, your pressure is actually increasing. So change modes if you need to, to help with your minute ventilation. And then here's a few. I don't know this will work. I took these just the other day in the ICU. So this right here on the left, this is actually a pressure volume loop. You can see it's actually in a volume control because it's actually more outward. You don't see any beaking there, so you know there's no over distension going on. But here on this mode, usually we have a square flow waveform on our um, on most volume controls. And here on this specific ventilator, you can actually change your flow waveform pattern. And as you can see, as it decelerates, which is more like a pressure like a pressure regulated deliver delivery, then this beaking starts to go away. You can kind of see it start to flatten out. So that's more of a lung protective uh, breath delivery. And here, this is pressure control. So you can see the, the big difference here. Here, it's kind of like going out at a 45 degree angle. And here, because pressure is what you're limiting, it's going to be more vertical. And then a higher waveform would need a good compliance because you're getting a good um, volume change for any given pressure change. And this last one is APV, which is the PRVC I was telling you about. It's kind of a mix of both, but it's got a little more of a pl pressure plateau there. Um, let me skip that so you guys can get going here on the uh, stuff. Uh, so last point, last thing I want to mention is your basic controls on your LTV, which Lauren's going to show you here. You got your respiratory rate on the left. You have your pressure control or your tidal volume, depending on what mode you're in. Pressure support if you're in spontaneous or SIMV. Then your FiO2 and your PEEP. This is your most important button here, right here. This is your silence and reset alarm button. Um, that thing will go off all the time. <laughs> and I've seen, just so you guys know, this is a, it's a dual function button. The first hit silences it, the second one resets it. And I can't imagine how many times I've walked by uh, beds and you guys are dropping your central lines. Um, and every two minutes, you're having someone go over and hit that. If you're not resetting the alarm, hitting it a second time, then two minutes later, which it's a two minute reset, just or silence, just like it is on the monitors. Two minutes later, it's gonna start alarming again. So um, two hits will actually reset it. You can actually use that two minutes to your favor too. Whenever we're coding and I take patients off the vent, I don't actually turn the vent off because when it starts beeping, that's your cue to do pulse checks. So you can kind of use that as a nice little guide. Um, basic alarm causes. Um, if you see a low pressure alarm, low minute ventilation alarm, what could that indicate? Disconnection the circuit or increased compliance, mostly a disconnection. Uh, high pressure alarms. Pneumothorax, so I love how you go right to that too. Uh, obstruction, pneumothorax, uh, patient biting on the tube, um, mucus plugs, anything that would impede your flow. Do right, so you guys have any questions on anything I went over? All right, so um, kind of just split up into little groups and kind of just make your way around. Um, and then, um, yeah, get your hands dirty. Thank you, guys. Thanks.